Welcome back to The Morning Show here on Arise News with me, Katira King. My next guest has reached a point in her life where she's decided to pursue only the things that give her joy. Her name is Yamisi Wada, and she is a lawyer and serial entrepreneur who recently produced the crime series Las Giddy Cops Serious Crimes Unit. Upon entering her golden year, she decided to start up a blog where she mentors the younger generations on the realities of relationships and life. She also loves giving back and is the founder of the Haven for the Nigerian Child Foundation, which is a foundation for the rehabilitation of street children. Please join me in welcoming Mrs. Yemi Siwada to The Morning Show. <laughs> Hello, Katia. Good morning. How Good morning. are you? Very well, thank you. I mean, we've got to talk about this outfit, first of all, with all the <laughs> detail going on there. I mean, you've just got to give us a little flap of the wings there. Where is that from? Orange culture. Gorgeous. Made in Nigeria. Made in Nigeria. By Nigeria to grow the Naira. I, all, all the time. <laughs> you know, I'm a serious advocate of that. I love that. And <laughs> also, a serious producer. Last giddy cops, huh? Yes. How exciting to produce a television series. But before we delve into depth, let's take a little look at it. Okay, thank you. Navdak is asking for the help of your team on this investigation. My team? Why do they need our help? They need your special talent. This one where I hear say one guy king girlfriend. What do you? Tell me what's in the one minute. I have a client in your custody. I give you the drug ring. You help me get him released. I'll see what I can do to get your client out. Well, what are you waiting for? It is your department. We need to get that software to make sure we divert all the votes. I am doing no such thing! Don't you ever tell me you will not do it. ever seen a police or security or armed forces TV series from Nigeria ever. Yes. Tell me about the inspirations behind creating this. Actually, um, I watch a lot of television <laughs> and I read a lot of books and especially crime books, but this particular one um, started, the thing for it came when I went to the police station in London because my daughter lost her phone right. and, you know, for insurance purposes. And I sat there and people were coming in to report different crimes. And I thought to myself, in Nigeria, I don't think I'd ever been to a police station. And many people wouldn't have. And we sort of associate the police station with negativity. negativity. Yes, absolutely. Meanwhile, I just thought, let, why don't we show something that portrays it in a way for people to see what the police really is supposed to do? Yeah. And then I realized we don't even have a crime series yeah, we do, running actually. now. Yeah. And we sat down together and we made this. And I'll tell you, it's been one of the most joyous experiences of my life. I enjoyed the writing of it. I enjoyed producing it. I enjoyed work, you know, working on it. And every time I watch it, it's like a renewed thing. I can imagine. Is that your sixth baby? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> now, you are incredibly inspirational because Asaka Productions is actually your own company that you founded. Yes. Talk to me about some of the uh, challenges in creating your own company in Nigeria. <laughs> <laughs> First of all, you know, the incorporation process is a lot. And there are little things that, for example, just the name of the company, you know, you need to get... Um, you, you know, you need to get, you, you, you find a name, then there's something called the availability to mm -hmm. see if you can have the name. And sometimes, you know, that takes a lot of process. And then sometimes the Registrar General has to approve, you know, just a little long-winded long process. process that I feel is really unnecessary. And then um, the, the length of time it takes, you know. And um, it's just every day... You know, things that you wouldn't think anywhere else should cause a problem, you know, is a real big deal. I know. But then again. 
Now, you have, I mentioned in your intro that in your golden years, you decided to just take life as it is <laughs> and live it to its fullest. And I meant it when I said you're such an inspiration because oh, you have you. taken what started out as not the best situation and really spun it on its head. And now you are living a glorious life. But let's rewind a little bit and talk about that situation because you have created Nam's blog to mentor people like myself yes. who are going through issues, whether they be relationship issues or business issues or personal issues. Talk to me about where that came from. What, what sort of issues were you going through in your own life to create that? Um, the first um, series in the NAMS blog, I talk about how I fell in love with myself. And it was because as a young girl, I grew up with great insecurities. Wow. And um, I ended up, I was in a marriage that ended up, that broke up when I was really young. I got married when I was 24. And by 27, the marriage was over. Wow. And I, at that time, I remember feeling so alone, you know, and what I was going through, I couldn't talk to many people about it. It was really tough. And I wish I had somebody that I could talk to about it. Now, over the years, and don't forget, at that time, there was no social media. Mm. There was no Instagram. There was nothing that you could read and see that other people were going through yeah. what you were going through. And then also no support groups either no in support Africa at that time. Either. And yeah. that was the thing. I was 27 and I yeah. had three children. I had two girls and I was pregnant. So I really had to be strong, strength that I didn't know I had. And so later on, with hindsight, over the years, I find out that, and I'm very open. You know, I talk about my problems even till today. I am like an open book. Yeah. And I find out that when I'm talking to people, people come up to me and say, oh, you're so open. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, is that unusual? It is. You know, and so with that, I thought, when I turned 50, I thought, I would like to talk to other people. Because, you see, with social media as well, people paint a picture of life. Yes. And, you know, you find so many young people thinking they're alone, yes. whereas other people have lives so fun, so good. Yes. And I thought, no, it's better to tell people you're not alone. This happens, and this happens, and this happens. And when I turned 50, I thought, this is, this is my way. You know, I always like to give back. I thought, for free, I like to tell young people, you know, you're not alone. This happens, this happens, and it's life. Yeah. And so I started. That's why that first one was, that first blog was how I fell in love with myself. Mm. And I talk about my issues, issues I went through, my insecurities. You suffer from a condition where you were pulling your own hair out yeah, as well. Yeah, tricotillomania. Wow. I suffered for that for many years. And it's amazing how many people have written to me thereafter, you know. And um, I'm glad that I did that because yeah. now I'm able to help. I'm able to talk to people about it. And it feels good. I can imagine. I mean, you are a woman that I heard about before I even knew of you. Oh. You know, from the things that people say, the way they laud you, because you have done such inspirational things with your life and your journey. And you mentioned your previous marriage. Now, it is something that I want to touch on briefly, because I believe it was the catalyst for a lot of the changes that you went through and the way you learned to love yourself. If we talk about women in bad relationships, quote unquote, bad relationships, why do you think that women stay? Because you were previously married to a politician, Femi Fanny Kayode. And you stayed for three years. Why? Well, it's really difficult because um, women stay because, first of all, culturally, you know, we're meant to, you know, abide by what goes on in a relationship. In fact, in, 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 in Yoruba tradition, they tell you, you know, being a wife, you know, is like, it's a school, it's a, it's a life, it's like a school of life's lessons. Yeah. So you don't throw in the towel. You just you go in there and you're meant to learn some lessons. So you're meant to endure. And then, you know, in Nigeria, we're a very um, religious society. Mm -hmm. I, I say that because, you know, and part of it, you know, you're as a wife, you're supposed to submit to what goes to your husband yes. and what goes on. So really, you're not supposed to throw in the towel. You're supposed to bear it, whatever goes on in there. And so, and then also, it's, 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 I want to tell you something. You see, what I realize is, when you go into a marriage and the marriage breaks up, it doesn't matter whether, at least from my personal experience, 
It doesn't matter whether you're vindicated, whether you were the one who was a victim mm -hmm. or you left. The fact that it fails makes you feel like you're a failure one way or the other, you know? And so you tend to naturally to, to wade it through to see if you can get over it. So I think a lot of things make you stay, but most importantly, and the most, I think the most thing that makes women stay is the culture. Yeah. And why is it, do you think, so culturally acceptable for women to stay in these bad relationships? You know, aside from the fact that we previously didn't have these support groups that are now being created, including your blog that you have, why, why is it acceptable for culture to dictate whether or not you should stay in an unhappy marriage? Oh, you could use that for so many things that's going on in, in our lives, you know, with, with, um, with Africans, you know, culture de de demands um, a lot of what we do. For example, you find out that the European is always investigating, you know, like we say, you see a mountain and the, 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 the Western man will look and say, I want to see what's on the other side of that mountain mm -hmm. and he'll climb that mountain. But for us, our culture and the way we live, you know, we, we, we feel that there are demons on top of that mountain, <laughs> there are spiritual things on that mountain, <laughs> and we stand there and we're praying against yeah. it. We never even go there. Mm -hmm. You know, we're not, we're not investigative in our way, in, you know, and that is a cultural thing. And I believe that is part of the things that hinder our development. But then again, that's a discussion for another day. But... We're led by our culture, we're led by our customs, and, you know, until we can get over that, you know, we're gonna have, a prob we're gonna have yeah. problems for a long time. Absolutely. Now, we're speaking about unhappy relationships and self-love. How does one go from the point of realizing that there's a problem to developing one's own self-love to walking away? Whew, it's not easy. I mean, if you read all these books, you know, and a lot of times you see on social media, they say, oh, love yourself. If you mm -hmm. can't love yourself, nobody how can you, will. nobody else mm -hmm. will, how can you love? But it's not that easy, it's, 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 particularly it's, when you're going through turmoil. It's a very difficult thing. But I think most importantly, you know, what I try and say, you know, to people in the blog is you need to realize that the, the other person is human as well, right. you know, in a relationship. So when you're feeling bad, you know, and it, it's very easy to internalize it, you know, I'm feeling bad. I think the first step is to see that, you know, you're feeling bad, but so is the other person, right. you know. And um, most importantly, you need to, you need to, um, you, you need to value yourself one way or the other for you to realize that if i don't that other person who's feeling bad as well can't value me yes. you know basically and um it's, it's, it's easier said than done i mean i can read you a lot of things i can say to you you know many things you have to love yourself you need to look in the mirror and say to yourself i am me i'm this but it's easier said than done yeah. it's another thing but it's something that needs to be done now, you give back to many young men and women via your mentorship program and blog, but you also have a foundation for street children where you help them rehabilitate themselves. Why is social work so important to you? Whew. You know, um, with the issue of the um, street children, I think, let me start off. I have many children, biological, I have five children. And you don't look like it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And I've always felt, you know, as a mother, you know, I, my greatest fear is a situation where I need to leave my children alone, you know. Yeah. And I've always thought to myself that, you know, if I give back, you know, I help somebody, somewhere or somehow I want to believe that by grace, you know, God forbid anything happened to me, my children will find a helper as well, yeah. you know, karma and all that. So that, that is something that stays with me in anything I do, whether it's my um, NGO or just my everyday life. I find it difficult not to help another person. And then with the street children, it was a phenomenon that I did not know 
I did not know existed in Nigeria because you know we have an extended family system. Yeah. I just did not think. I always assumed children on the streets were vagabond. Mm. I just did not. It never occurred to me that I would have homeless children. You know, orphans, orphans on the streets. You know, I just always thought because as a child, I, I, there are three of us children, and there's never been a time when. In my parents' house, there's just been my parents and the three of us. There's always been some one or two relatives, mm -hmm. at least. Even to present day, we've all left home. There's still people with my parents, mm -hmm. you know. And um, on my 40th birthday, I made some, had some food packs to give out, not to street children, but just to less privileged people, yes. you know. Uh, and um, I had these packs. It was a Sunday. I happened to be driving myself with just um, a nanny with me to help. And on Uzumba, we packed and out of the blue came a group of like 16, 17 wow. young boys, m mainly boys. Mm -hmm. And they came with such force, we felt that we were being attacked, mm -hmm. you know? So we practically had to drive round and throw the packs out. Wow. And after that, I thought, where are they? Where did they come from? Because they're not like the beggars that stand on mm -hmm. this. They came out of nowhere. And I started to inquire, and I found out that they actually were boys that lived on Kuramu Beach. Oh, and that was which how... Which is now Bar Beach, which, which is has now, been totally taken away. Wow. And that was how that started. So they effectively had homes on what was Kuramu Beach. Yes, Then the had, government demolished it all to build the The government front. just demolished it recently yeah. to create the eco-Atlantic city, but they lived left on homeless. that beach wow. for years. I mean, I, I was there for like um, four years before it was demolished and working with these boys. Wow. And it, I just, and then we started talking to them, finding out why they left home for different reasons. A lot of them were just, most of them are not from Lagos. You know, they've come to Lagos to try and make a living. And, you know, they, they've, when they've run away from home, they, you tend to find out that even though they themselves are not in conflict with the law, they find refuge with those mm -hmm. who are, like, prostitutes. I mean, in Kuramo Beach, you know, they were living door to door with the sheds mm -hmm. that were for the prostitutes, pe um, people selling drugs, you know, all sorts. So that, that's their natural refuge, because they're not where they're supposed to be. But they themselves are not necessarily vagabonds or anything like that. It's, it's an interesting journey. Now, you are, I mean, if I've said it once, I've said it a million times, so inspirational, and you are oh. making such huge strides in creating positivity in our community. What sort of impact are you looking to leave in Nigeria and beyond? Ooh. I think, you know, in everything, like, um, I just believe that when you, when you meet a situation in life and you leave, what do people say about you? You know, that, that's mine. What impact do you have? You know, you, some people can come into the world and leave like, like nothing happened. But I want to believe that what I'll be remembered for is that I made a positive impact one way or two ways, but at least I made a positive impact, even if it's three people that can come up and say, oh, she changed our lives thus, then I'm happy. Wow. Well, you're definitely changing lives one at a time. Thank you. Now, for those of my viewers who want to read up on your blog, find out about your social mentorship program, inquire about the New Haven for the Child Foundation, how can they reach you via social media? Oh, um, www.haven for the Nigerian Child Foundation for the... Um, NGO, working with street children, um, www.namsblog.com.ng for the blog, which talks about relationships, and um, on Facebook as well. And then you've got your Instagram and your Twitter handles? Yes, at Nama Wada for the Twitter and at Yemisi Wada for Instagram. Amazing stuff. Thank you so much for joining me, Mrs. Wada. Thank you for having me. We're going to catch up right after the break because we're discussing what you are, which is a woman in leadership. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> now, those are all the golden nuggets of wisdom you'll be getting from Mrs. Wada for now as it's time for a short break on The Morning Show. Stay tuned as when we return, it's time for our take. Don't go away. <laughs> 